it's Linda and that's Sh- Terry, that's me, yeah, that's yeah, Sharon, yeah. Yeah. and that's Denise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. The key person in our family was Nan Carrington. She had six children, they all got married, and they all left children. Those parents produced 16 children, and I am one of those, and the others are my cousins. And that's why we call this the Carrington Cousins. We decided that we would film each of the cousins talking about their life as children and how different it is to today. And it's been enormous fun. In the latter part of the war, uh, Nan was in the garden and she had a large black grate, cooking grate, which was the oven and so on. And uh, she asked me to put coal into the, the fire to keep it going, which was going all day long. And uh, there was the bunker outside, the open bunker. So I did my duty, got some coal, shoved it into the fire, went back out in the garden with her. She was hanging out washing, I believe. And suddenly there's a big bang. Smoke coming out the back door. Of the kitchen. Uh, we all go running in there. And she pulled out the grade. And what it was, we found a spent bullet and the cartridge. And what it must have been, a bullet must have dropped from a plane into the coal bunker not realising what it was, or seeing it, shoving it into the fire, and of course, bang. My dad was in the army when I was born. He did come home briefly, as they hadn't then gone abroad, uh, when I was about three weeks old. Obviously, I had no recollection of that. Uh, And I never saw him again until I was over three. And I knew who he was when he walked in because my mum had continually showed me a photograph of him in his army uniform, and um, when he came in, I knew that was my dad. When Dad got his minivan, or not minivan, the dormobile, we all used to pile into that, 15 of us, and go to Cornwall and Shoebury Ness every Saturday, every Sunday, and um, used to have really great days out, really good. Once we went on a day trip to Wimbledon, for some reason, and the van broke down, and I can remember us all having to come home by train, underground, and I always remember Auntie Edie had her indoor slippers on and we all laughed because we was all on this train and she had her indoor slippers on. But that's how it used to go out in those days. Dad had a, he got a, got a big drum and he sunk it in the ground in the garden. So it was cool all the time. We used to keep milk and butter and that in there. And it was always cold. Um, and that's probably still there at 15 Hockley Avenue now. Because fridges and freezers weren't invented then, and I'm sure if there was, nobody could have afforded them. Fashion then was flared skirts with lots of petticoats, which absolutely ruined your tights, or stockings then it was. And, uh, you know, high-heeled, very narrow-toed shoes, which by the end of the evening were absolutely crippling you. But luckily, as we had, most of us had the same size feet. We'd just swap shoes coming home, which totally relieved your feet and made it easier for walking home. I always did fairly well at school, but um, got in with a group of friends and we used to muck about. But the only time I got into trouble was I, had, I got the cane, which was quite unusual for a girl. But we were playing rounders on the school field at lunchtime and there was a a group of girls who weren't our particular friends that sat right in the middle of our rounders pitch and would not move and we were all playing and um, I told them to, I don't know if I can say this, I told them to bugger off out of the way. <laughs> For which, before I knew it, she'd gone and reported me and I was outside the headmistress's door <laughs> and got the cane. For some... But she was a, a funny old girl, our headmistress, and Miss Lloyd, I can always remember her, and she said, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you, and I'm sure it did. The house I was born in, 12 Brandy Road. It's a very small house, a very small terraced house. You would not imagine how many people lived in each house along the street. Uh, we had uh, three families living in the same house. Uh, my nan lived in one, one bedroom. My aunt Edna and Uncle Albert, Sandra and Barry, their two children, lived in another bedroom. Myself, my sister Linda, uh, my mum and dad lived in the third bedroom. Although it was a small house, we were not aware at all of it being overcrowded. It was just a real fun, loving place to be. It's just remembering 
sort of going in and seeing Nan. I remember going to her 80th, which was a surprise party. Um, she'd been kept down at Auntie Vera's for the day and was brought up and I can remember seeing her little face. And as much as she had all this big family around her, she was a tiny little woman, but she ruled the roost. So, uh, and even at that point, she would still walk around with one or other of the great grandchildren tucked under her arm while making tea for the hold. And I can remember seeing the photos afterwards that even at that point, she still had her penny on, which was a big wrap over sort of dress pinafore. Well, I first met Pete uh, in 1956. Him and his dad used to get the bus of a morning to Brentwood Station, the same as I did, and they would pass me because they walked quicker and I was tottering on high heels and say good morning. And then one evening as I was coming back into Brentwood to get the last bus home, he suddenly came out of the snooker hall with a crowd of friends and just walked up and said, well, I'm taking the wife home, who's coming? And that's how we got together. This particular day I'd been at school and had domestic science and I was making a gatto, very pleased with it, this orange thing, very, very good. And we were supposed to take a tin and I'd forgotten. So my friend lent me the top of her tin, so I had the cake sitting on it, so I'm carrying it very carefully. And we came out of school and our Sheila used to never had a bag over her shoulder, always used to hold it like this. And she got in an argument with a girl. And this girl hit her. And she went, hold me bear guy. And this bear came flying across on my chest, on the ghetto, all down me. <laughs> and she's having a fight and I'm trying to pick me ghetto off. When I was at school, I wanted to be an architect, but girls wasn't allowed to do that sort of thing. You done needlework, you done cooking or you done office work, and that was it, because then you was going to get married no children, so I wasn't allowed to take that sort of thing. So I tended to rebel a bit, and I thought, if I can't do what I want to do, I'm not going to do what they want me to do. So I tended to play, play truant a lot, and I was always in some sort of trouble. Whereas Eileen never, Eileen was always got on with things, but I was often in trouble at school. When I was younger, the one thing that stuck in my mind was the fact that uh, we all had our family units, mum, dad, brothers and sisters, etc. But in the middle of that uh, group of families was Nan. She was central to everything. And because we used to visit her a lot and that, we obviously have kept in contact with all the cousins and we had quite a few memorable moments with the cousins, you know, enjoyable moments. One of the things I remember is having to go outside, first of all, before our bathroom was built, to the toilet, which was really daunting when he was little and it was pitch black outside. We never had outside lights, of course, and uh, we'd have to run into the toilet, open the door quickly, go in and bolt it, always frightened of the bogeyman, um, flush the toilet, and then run full pelt to the back door to get in and slam the back door. And I can remember doing it so regularly and always being frightened of it. And then Dad decided to make a bathroom, and our bathroom consisted of a bath, with no taps on, and a toilet. And that's all it was, we never had a sink there. Yeah, sure.